Well, Kate Kunkel, welcome and thank you so very much to accept my invitation for this uh, interview today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I always love to talk about vibroacoustic therapy and sound therapy. Wow. So when I saw uh, the word vibrotronics, it was the first time that I saw that word. I heard about uh, music therapy, but uh, for me, the word vibrotronics uh, looked different. But before we go there... Yes, uh, sorry, vibroacoustic, yes. Right, but before we go there, uh, what uh, surprised me is your journey, because uh, you, <laughs> you come from a very, very, very uh, interesting path. So you were uh, in the, 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 you were, I think you were a lawyer before, so you jumped to television industry, and then you found yourself through the heart. Tell us about I did. Training. Yeah, you did, huh? Yeah, so um, I, I was in the legal field. I was actually a paralegal before anybody knew what paralegals were. This is back in the early, uh, late 70s, actually. And um, I was uh, doing very well, and I started law school. Um, and I realized very quickly within two weeks that I could not spend the rest of my life in that world. I, I felt like my soul was being uh, dismantled. So I went home and I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And my husband at the time said, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a writer. And so at that time, there was no such thing as internet, of course. So um, we got an on, um, a, a correspondence course. And I began studying writing. And the first thing I did was write an article for Let's Live magazine. It was a Canadian publication back then. And it was on the dangers of um, estrogen, of, of birth control pills. Right. And that got me on my path. It was just how I realized that I, I had to be doing something to help people on a physical, emotional, spiritual level. So um, then my husband at the time was invited to uh, a place in California to work. So we traveled to Los Angeles and I started working there in the movie industry just for something to do. And I was writing there. And then um, we had quite a change in our lives and, and uh, it was very stressful. It's very stressful there in Hollywood. Yeah. And um, <laughs> when you're in show business and I was stressed to the max and as a result of a dream, um, I began to play the harp. The dream was uh, um, given to me, I truly believe, because of a prayer. How, how, I, how did it happen? Tell us the first day that you touched the instrument. How did so it came? It came, I was on my way home from a business meeting, which was um, one of the million meetings that I had to go to all the time. And I was so distraught, Francois, that I, I actually considered driving over a bridge. I was so unhappy and so stressed. And I realized that that was absolutely ridiculous, that this, this couldn't continue like this. So I went home and I laid in bed and I, I sent out a prayer. And I just said, if there's anybody out there, please, I need your help. Because I know that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing but I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And in that dream that night, I played a harp. Francois, I've never seen a harp in person. I had no interest in it. I never, I knew nothing about the instrument. Really? Nothing. I'd never seen one except maybe on Lawrence Welk when I was a little kid and my dad used to make us <laughs> So, I, but in this dream, Francois, even Today, this is 30 years later, when I remember that dream, my heart is filled. I know that that was given to me as my, my future, my, what I was here on earth to do. So I can remember the feeling of peace that I mm -hmm. felt as I was playing this harp in this dream. So the next morning, 
I got up and said, I have to get a harp. <laughs> God bless him. He, he said, okay, we'll find one. And I didn't know anything about the folk harps, which is what I play now. But um, I certainly couldn't afford one of those big concert harps at the time. So anyway, we found a harp. And one year from the day that I got my hands on that first harp, we shut down everything and moved on a wing and a prayer, literally, to Las Vegas. One year from the date that I began, that we moved there, we began working full time as um, a harp and guitar duo called Crosswind in in Excalibur, and we were oh. there for many years. And we we and while I was there, I met a gentleman whose wife had multiple sclerosis. And I had just read about this harpist. His name was Dr. Ron Price. He had, um, I think it was a form of Parkinson's. Okay. And he was no longer able to play his primary instrument, which was trumpet. Mm. Um, somebody said to him, well, why don't you try the harp? We hear that the harp is good for healing. So Ron said, I got to do something. I have to play music. So he got a harp and he began playing the, the harp as therapy for that. And he was able then eventually to um, reverse the symptoms of his Parkinsonian. Parkinsonian really? <laughs> yeah. So I had read about his story. This is, of course, long before the internet. I read about his story. And I thought, well, this lady that I know, that this, this woman, maybe we can help her. Because she was young. She was only like in her mid-30s. And she was in a wheelchair already and she was unable to even like write her name or anything mm. so we got tiny harp from pakistan <laughs> and, and and i would go to their house and we would um play it like at first she couldn't like she couldn't um actually pluck the strings at all all i did is i would guide her hand on it and the idea was to get the vibration going right so it's all about vibration it, it's about frequencies yeah so I would get her going and it would, she would feel it to her body. And, and so then every day her husband would work with her and they would get it. And over time, over the six months that I worked with her, she was able to type again. She could, she could do that. She couldn't walk again, but she could certainly, all of her upper body functions came back. So um, now they, they didn't renew their, her, his contract. So I don't know what happened after that because they moved away. But I do know that, that she had quite, and so of course now I've got this whole, whole thing to think about. Okay, so, so this she, is why I play the harp. She, she was uh, kind of your first uh, patient. Yes, exactly. And it was completely just an experiment thinking, well, if it worked for Dr. Price, then surely it can work for her. So, and he was, you know, really quite far advanced as well. Anyway, that got me on this path. And so then I started doing research and I learned a little bit about in Vegas at the time they had this place. It was a big building, a, a room, and there was a vibroacoustic um, panel. Like there were, there were transducers set actually in seats in this. It was like a little auditorium. Uh. And you could go there experience the vibroacoustics. This is what we call a vibroacoustics. So there is like yes. an amplificator. Amplifier. Well, not normally. Not normally. This one was more of a, it was kind of a, like a sound spa. Oh. You would call it a sound spa. So people come in. Now we call them sound baths. People do this all the time with gongs and things. Yeah. But that, this was a very new thing. So that got me thinking, okay, so if the Vibroacoustic, if the, if the vibrations from the harp working personally, what would happen if we put the harp through the, this kind of a system? So it took a while and we found one of these, um, a vibroacoustic chair. Dr. Jeffrey Thompson created it. He was in um, uh, San Diego, California. So we got one of these chairs. And at the time, I didn't realize that there was a whole program on vibroacoustic harp therapy, which I ended up taking later. But I started experimenting with it. And we used um, recorded, uh, like recordings that go through the chair. So you, the vibroacoustic experience itself, you actually lie on a, 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 a custom, like it's a, a lounge, or you sit in a chair, or there's a cushion. 
And rather than speakers, we just have transducers, which are speakers without the cones, right? It's just sending the vibration from the source, an amplification system, and it creates vibration on whatever it is you're lying on. And of course, those sound oh waves go- Oh my God, it might be just amazing. Wow, stop, I want to try that. <laughs> yeah, it, well, actually, I think there's, no, not in Sri Lanka. I don't know about any in Sri I was thinking over oh, Montreal, but no, no, you're not there. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. I will be there later, but right now in Sri Lanka, no, I don't believe. But I mean, <laughs> no. just, just amazing. Um, you might feel like in, in heaven with that. What is the feeling on uh, sitting there? Yeah, it is. So what happens is um, the vibration, you, you, it's very much a mind-body experience. So you experience the tactile feel, yes. And remember, just like when... Uh, a drop of water, a, dr a stone goes into a pond and all those ripples come out, that sound wave works like a stone and it sends ripples of energy through your body because we're mostly water, right? So it sends those ripples of energy and sound through your body. To be able to use this therapeutically, now that, that's when you, you can use most anything to make that happen as long as it has base frequency because the fiber of... Uh, Fibroacoustic range of frequencies we use is 30 to 100, 110, 120 hertz. hertz. I only use 30 to 86, but um, that's the range of frequencies that fits within vibroacoustics. Ah. When, so, so because you need that low for the bass, right, to get the, 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 the stuff moving, the, the frequencies sending water and everything through your body. Anyway. It's, it is more efficient when it, uh, there is a low, vibe, low uh, frequency. You have to. Yeah. Okay. By, okay. by its very definition, vibroacoustic therapy is very low frequency. Yeah, I understand. Low, right. So when you get that then, now we use specific frequencies, not in music, just specific frequencies to deal with specific issues. Ah. So for example, um, Alzheimer's, which is my area of specialty and what I've been researching for the last 10 years, we use 40 hertz to help. We're not exactly sure why it works, but for some reason, when you apply 40 hertz to people who have mild to moderate Alzheimer's, you can actually see a reduction in the symptoms. So that means that the memory will improve, Executive function will approve a, li in really? improve a little bit. Yeah. Dr. Lee Bartel is in Toronto, Canada, and he is one of the primary researchers in this field at this time. And he just, he's just come out with a couple of papers not too long ago about it. So we know now the thing is though, and this is true of almost all frequency based work that I've been involved in. You have to keep at it. So, so you can get the benefits, but if you stop, it comes back. It's just like when Dr. Price, the, the heart, um, the original heart therapy, when he stopped, his symptoms would come back. So, so you have to keep this up. So I would work with Parkinson's patients, and for them, we use 30 hertz because it can actually, Francois, amazing. With 30 hertz, you will see the tremors. A person will come on with tremors, yeah. And you will see those tremors dissipate wow. with the 30 hertz. The gait will improve. So I would have clients come in and they would, I would watch them walk and we would monitor their gait. And then when we put them on the sound system, we would walk again afterward and their gait would actually improve. They would become much more steady. Right. So that's what 40 hertz can do. Since but, got it. Yeah, I, I have a question that came to my mind because I just figured out myself receiving that and I believe that it would bring me to heaven. Uh, is, <laughs> is there, um, I don't know how to express that, is there uh, emotional uh, relief uh, and uh, I would go any further, a spiritual connection that happened when you receive that kind of treatment? Yes. Um, it, of course, it depends on, on what, what, um, what the person is, if the person is actually paying attention to it. So like my husband, 
he, he has lung issues. So we, I, the reason I created a 40 to 75 hertz variable program was to help with his lungs. Um, he likes to read on that. And that's okay, because it's still doing the physical part of it, but we're not getting the mind-body connection going, right? If you pay attention and you really feel what's happening in your body, um, firstly, you will notice that there might be old injuries or something that comes up that, that the sound will tweak a little bit. So like, say you had a knee injury, yeah. you will feel that old injury. It's almost like a memory comes up. And then I, I, I tell my clients, just acknowledge it, feel it, and then let it go. Because if it's coming up, that means that there's still something there you need to deal with. So let it go. Um, many, I can't tell you how many times when, I treated, when I've treated people, they start crying. It's like they, there's something with the sound. It's primordial. Well, what is the first thing we experience? In the womb, it's sound, it's yeah. vibration. Yeah. Yes. So that comes out. It and may that's unlock it, something. It may unlock something. Precisely. I do believe, I think that's a very good word. You've chosen a very good word for that. It unlocks something. And so um, that, that's a very big part of it. And when I combine it with the harp, so when I, because I, I can plug the harp in then through the system. Really? And then I monitor, oh boy, it is amazing what happens. Wow. Because then I, put, yeah, so I plug the harp in, it has a, um, a pickup in it. So I plug the harp in and then we send those frequencies. And the good thing is because I can monitor my clients. So I, I will play one bass note at a time. I figure out what key they resonate in at that time. On that day, because it changes all the time. On that day, I figure out what key they're in, what they're, they're responding to, and then I can play in that key. And because I'm, I improvise all the time, then I, I just create music. I monitor their body position. I monitor whether they're getting emotional. We work with the heart rhythm. And then I'm telling you, the first few times anybody ever does this, they always cry. I've never had someone not cry. It's 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 a little bit... Uh, a, a little bit like a, a mix of art and science, huh? because I, I've read yes, your papers yeah. and, and you are very much into uh, the connection with uh, the brain, metabolism, etc. What does happen to the brain, actually, when we receive this uh, approach? What does, what does happen? I wish I knew. I really don't know. It's, it's like so much about the brain. We see the physical things that happen. If I had an MRI, if I could hook someone up to an MRI when I did it, that would be great or some other way of uh, analyzing it. But I do know that the, the, because we, we, um, we get the hormones going, right? We get the endorphins going, the feel-good uh, hormones, the uh, oxytocin, we get that going. So I'm pretty sure that it's the hormonal thing that's happening there, but I, I honestly don't know. All I know is that it absolutely 100% triggers something. And, and that can either be with just the, the specific frequencies, the 30 or 40, whatever hertz we're using, or it can be with music, recorded music, or it can be with the harp. It happens with everything. And, and I, I do believe that probably some of the, horm the hormonal things are a big part. Yeah. Because that's, that's what we are, right? Absolutely. And uh, I was a little bit surprised when uh, I realized that you can even work with the uh, sciatic nerve conditions of a patient. Can you talk about these kind of physical disease? Because you have experienced that with your patient. What happened at that moment? Yeah, so, so we, we work with a lot of different problems, everything from um, heel spurs to, to recovering. Uh, there's a doctor, a heart surgeon, who actually used vibroacoustic therapy. I don't know if he's still doing it. It might have been a, just a trial, but he actually used vibroacoustic therapy with just the pure frequencies for post-surgical um, patients. Wow. And he actually was able to increase or decrease their recovery time because when you're actually sending the vibroacoustics through the, um, the patient, 
you're improving blood flow, you're improving oxygenation. All of that's happening because you're, you're, you're improving circulation. That's a huge thing that we do for people who are, say, bed bound, for bed sores, that sort of thing. We get the circulation going. For people who have diabetes, we do not treat diabetes. We can't do that. We can't do anything about the insulin resistance problem. However, we can help with the neuropathy. So yeah. we're getting the, the blood flowing. Um, the same with the heart patients. So what he saw was that when he actually subjected them to um, vibroacoustic therapy, they got out of intensive care two to three days earlier than normal. That's a big deal because that's, I think that's a lot of money, but also it's also a, a huge benefit to the patient to get up and going and getting out there better. They've done it with heart, uh, uh, hip replacements, knee replacements. So wow. the recovery time is much faster. You get a much better response. And actually, it even helps if you start before. So like my brother-in-law, I uh, get, he, we have a little cushion, a, a, a portable cushion from Sound Oasis. And he put that, he used that before his knee surgery. On the second knee, because the first knee was a disaster, lots of problems. So the second knee, we put the vibroacoustics on before he even had the surgery. And then after, and he was up and at him in six weeks this time instead of three months. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Just what it's doing. We are actually, that means we're getting more oxygen. The t t tissues themselves can regenerate faster. Bone can regenerate faster because it's getting the nutrients it needs. Now, of course, Everything that we do, if we're working on a physical level, on something that's a physical issue, we also have to deal with nutrition. And that's why I'm a nutritionist, because I feel that we, you know, I took the time later on, I'm a vegan nutritionist, and, and I believe that a whole foods plant-based diet is the best choice for most people. There are some that it's not going to work for. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So we add that to the vibroacoustics and all the other things that you need to do, whether it's for your brain or your body, and that's how we can heal faster and we can create the, the environment in our physical bodies to be healthier. But then also when we're healthier, when, we're, when we are physically at our best, we also can bring in all of the spiritual, we can learn better, we can connect to others better. And maybe to yourself, maybe you can connect uh, to yourself first, right? Uh, there is a, um, an amazing therapeutic effect of uh, art therapy in general. So uh, all you spoke right now is the, the, I would say, the medical approach, which is fantastic. It's just, it's a healing approach. But uh, from what I know, I would like to have your opinion on that is... Art therapy uh, helps the patient transcend things that they can't express with words, something that is blocked. Have you seen that among your patients? How, how, how does it happen? Um, well, with, with the vibroacoustics? Yes, music therapy and vibroacoustics in general. Yeah, so I haven't really, because I haven't worked with somebody on that level so much. Most of my work, um, when I was when I had my clinic and everything, that was based much more on the physical. I worked in a sports clinic for a while. I've worked with Parkinson's clients. So I mostly work with the physical, with the vibroacoustics. Now, when we get into my other work with with dealing with the brain, with with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, there we're on a whole different level. There we're talking about how sound and music specifically, um, and creating music, creating art. Um, I highly recommend, in fact, it's a huge part of my book that, that's coming out soon, is that people create music, that people create art, even creating a journal, writing a journal, drawing in a journal. All of those things, like you said, allow you to express things that you can't express with words. And that's why talk, talk therapy, talk therapy's got its place. It absolutely does. But with like PTSD, with those kinds of problems, it's much more effective to add either art therapy or music therapy. They, they have much better results for people 
getting through PTSD or, or, or managing it, I guess is really what it is, with art and music therapy, maybe combined with, with talk therapy. Right. Um, it just seems to, to because it, it gets to those places you can't get to with your voice, with your, yeah. with your rack mind. You yeah. need to get to the subconscious, and you can't get to the subconscious if you're yapping. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it, 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 it <laughs> comes out in a, in, a, in a different way, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Why did you end up in South America? Now you live in Ecuador, you're Canadian, you live in the United States, you cross the world. <laughs> what a journey. <laughs> How did you end up there? Um, well, uh, when I was leaving the United States, I had been on television for nine years um, just before I left the U.S. And I was offered a job here in Ecuador to uh, host a television program, which is what I did. Um, but I, I um, turned it down because I wanted to go home and spend time with my family. I've been away for 25 years. So I went home. And um, that was about the time that my mom was diagnosed with dementia. And so that's, I, I think I needed to go home to find my next step to find what I needed to do next to help people. Anyway, so my, my research in dementia started then, but then um, my husband, my current husband and I, we were trying to decide what we could do in terms of retirement because he's, he's almost 70 and it was, what are we going to do? Because we didn't want to stay where it's cold <laughs> in Canada. And I, my whole life, I had dreamt of having a place of peace and healing. In fact, in, in journals from the 80s, I have these drawings of this place to have a place of peace and healing. And we decided to come to Ecuador for an exploratory trip because we understood it was inexpensive to, to retire here. So we started driving around and we were here for two weeks. And then we landed at a bed and breakfast just around the corner. And we said, we love this country because the people are so genuine and, and self-sufficient. Like, and I'm really seeing it here with COVID. So we said, you know, we're going to come back. We're going to see if we can't find a place. And the lady who owned the B&B &B said, well, there's a place right around the corner. Why don't you go have a look? So she called the owners because it was for sale. And we came here and... It was five buildings and a dirt lot. That was it. Half acre of dirt lot. And it was by the ocean. It was warm. And there was a place that I could see in my mind's eye. And thank God my husband could see the same thing. I could see the potential for my place of peace and healing. After all these years, this was it. And it would be within my reach because the price of real estate is so much less here. A, a second dream, a second dream, like the harp dream, now the place dream. So yep, dream, place dream, dream, dream played a, a huge role in your life. Maybe we should listen to our dream more. Huh? Oh boy, yes, yes, we should. <laughs> more. And, and, and put ourselves in a, a situation when we go to bed at night that we can remember those dreams. Because if yes. you don't remember, them, it doesn't do much good. Right? <laughs> but I... Anyway, I I believe that your heart dream, uh, whether you, you, you did anything, you, you remembered it anyway, right? It was a very oh, uh, yeah. vivid one, no? right? Oh, yeah, because I can still feel it to this day. Yeah. Of course. So <laughs> uh, tell me, now you're on a journey to write books. Now you, you, it's not enough. All of what you do is not enough. You need to write books and you're on another book. Tell me about that book. It seems to be so amazing. Well, the first book is actually The Healing Sound of Music. And that was written um, based on the experience we had in Las Vegas working with people there and then um, doing research. This was back in 2000 that that book came out. So um, I, and I'd always been writing since, since 1984. So um, writing is a big part of the way I communicate what I feel people may benefit from. Um, so the Healing Sound of Music was the first one. And then I was writing magazine. I've been writing magazine articles and everything for years in addition to all my other stuff. But this book came because of mom's diagnosis with dementia. And I knew that there was something that music could do. Unfortunately, we learned, we got my mom's diagnosis really too late to 
make a big difference in the progress of her disease. Um, and that's a big problem, and that's one of the reasons my whole first chapter is in the new book, which is called Don't Let the Memories Fade. The whole idea is to help people recognize the, the, the little signs that you might be having some issues or a family member might be having some issues and offering uh, ways to get tested. Or, and, and even more importantly, if there's even one little hint and it can be something as simple as getting mixed up on the way back from a trip. Like you're not, you're not a hunt. Like even though you may have taken the trip many times before and you're not hundred percent sure how to get back and that happens. And that is a sign. That's something that, that there's something going on in your brain and you need to think about it. You need to look after it. Right. So that, that's one of the things. Uh, I remember my father also uh, passed with Alzheimer. And now that you're telling this, uh, at a certain point, I was uh, hiving my iPhone and I played an artist, La Bolgic, which is a French Canadian uh, singer that he, he saw when he was very, very young in the 30s or something. And his eye was becoming clear and suddenly when i was playing that music he kind of woke up and do you yes. believe you, there is a memory connection i guess that you have seen that with your patient also didn't you oh yes so so the memory the music the part of our brain that responds to the music that stores the music i guess it's not really storage but um that, that's triggered that is the last part of our brains. Oh. And, and, and those memories that, that are triggered by the music, it's not even, the, it's partly the music itself because of the joy, the joy, the enjoyment, but it's the memories that are triggered by the music. There's a doctor, I think it's his last name is Pescatore in, in um, California, I think he is. He works with dementia patients with all the senses. So we have the sound, the music, and the best way to do it is like you were with your dad, to have the music playing and to be able to talk about the memories. So if we have a, a dementia patient who's there and they want to talk about, oh, I danced the first dance with my wife, that music and that sort of thing. Smell is a hugely important sense and it brings back memories. Touch, so like the satin of a wedding gown or a, or a nightgown or the, the soft plush of a toy. Um, those senses are so important to help bring dementia patients into a place where they can communicate, where they can um, connect because they, they are, they're not really connecting most of the time. Yeah? But those are also the things that we can use to help prevent dementia. The, 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 the idea of getting our senses fully engaged um, and to learn all the time is so important to learn. Yes. Whether, and music, music and language. Those are the two things that if we can continue learning that we are, firstly, did you know, this is, I find this fascinating. The brains of trained musicians, and they don't have to be working professionally or anything, but they've had some degree of training, and it doesn't have to be a lot. The two hemispheres, the corpus callosum, which is between the two hemispheres, yes. is thick, stronger in musicians. And they think that it is because with musicians, we use the right and the left side of our brains all the time when we're, when we're playing, because it's the math, music is math, and we're doing the creative side. So that connection between our hemispheres is exceptionally strong. If you want to help prevent any kind of cognitive decline, those are the things you need to do. You need to keep learning new things and building the connections. We want those neurons finding new pathways to connect with each other and to strengthen. Right. That's called cognitive reserve. Oh my God, it's fantastic. And uh, so it is for the, the dancer also, because I was also a musician, musician and dancer in the past. So I believe that the corpus callosum is becoming a best, uh, uh, because it's a connector, no? From the left hemisphere yes. to the right hemisphere. 
Yes, exactly. It connects the two. And when you're dancing, now just just it's not really going to get both sides going. But if you're doing something like salsa or tango or something where you have to remember steps and actually work with a partner, that's when it really benefits. Now, dancing is great exercise, and it's one of the things I recommend people do as exercise, but also as a social activity because that's the other part of uh, things that we have to really pay attention to when we're looking after our brain. We're, we're meant to be together, right? Humans are meant to spend yes. time together. Yes, absolutely. And, and our brains need that. Right. And so that's another thing that helps. What is the, um, I would say, the most surprising uh, discovery that you made along the path of your, uh, I would say, professional development and meeting so many patients and seeing so many different cases and so much healing? You, you get used to the good result and happy, but what surprised you the most? Uh, well, a case study that surprised me the most was doing vibroacoustic therapy for a lady who had trigeminal neuralgia. This woman had been suffering trigeminal neuralgia for 10 years. For those uh, with listeners who don't know or viewers who don't know, we have a nerve that comes up here and it branches into three branches and it, it affects our eyes all along here and here, the jaw. And um, she had basically this neuralgia, which is very painful, and it's, it's very disruptive even to sight. She was having trouble hearing. She couldn't even feel herself swallow oh my God. Uh, anymore. Like she couldn't feel the stuff going down. She could, she could swallow, but she couldn't feel like cold water or anything going down. So when she came to me, um, it was as a result of a reference from her mother who'd come to me for foot problems. But this woman, she came to me and she said, my mother says, I have to come see you. So I'm here. And she was very skeptical and um, really wasn't sure what to expect. But we talked for a while. And when you're dealing with neurological issues, you need to go higher, a little bit higher on the vibroacoustic scale. You need to go the, like the, 80, 80. The higher pitch. The higher pitch. So we started off with 86 hertz and what I did very gently because she had a lot of pain and with vibroacoustics, like any vibration, you can trigger pain if you're, if you're aggravating something that's already painful. Yeah. So very, very low intensity on the, on the lounge. And then over the course of a couple of weeks, she came three times a week there at the beginning. She was desperate. And the, at the, after the first day, she could feel that it was not, not so bad. She said, I don't in my head of what this real, but I'm going to do it. So she came three times a week. And over the course of a couple of weeks, I could increase the um, intensity. intensity of the microacoustics. Mm -hmm. And it got so that she would actually press her, the, face, the side of her face that was affected against the, the cushion so she could feel it more. Wow. She wanted it more. So we built up the intensity. And then we added the heart to it. So oh. we not only had the vibroacoustic going underneath, then we added the heart therapy to it. And because then I could actually um, use the, the strings that would most um, impact that nerve. Because uh, we would test it and we would figure out, okay, today the nerve wants this frequency. So then I could just add that to, to the vibroacoustics. Anyway, so we did that. And... Um, she was coming back and she was feeling so much better. Her ear wasn't, because she had such pain in her ear from this even. She came one day, she said, Kate, I don't have any pain in my ear. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. If that's all you do, that's great. Anyway, over the course of the while, we kept going. One day, and I always give water. You must always have water after you do vibroacoustics because it's like having a workout. All your cells are moving around. It's the same as having a workout. So you can become dehydrated. So I always would give my clients alkaline water afterward. So this one day I gave her the water and she drank it and she started crying. She put the glass down. She started crying. I get so emotional when I even talk about this for her. She said, Kate, I felt the water. I oh, felt the cool. Wow. So of all the things that I've been able to do in my life, that, that moment, that moment was probably one of the most incredible. And I realized the power of persistence. 
because she wasn't, I mean, that was weeks and weeks we were working on that. Yeah. Over all those years. And, and she came to me, she kept a couple more months after that and things get better. And then it was pretty rapid. The, the improvement was pretty rapid after that. It was like it set up a, a steamroller and, and things were getting better and better. And um, she went, came for a couple more months, a couple times a week. And then it tapered off to once a week and then once a month. And then I closed my practice there because we were getting ready to move here. So right. um, but she was happy. She, she said, that's good. I'm fine. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, you mentioned a very important word because I'm also a healer, as I told you, and uh, persistence, right? Because uh, we are complementing what uh, classic medical medicine can or cannot do. And uh, we are, I mean, doing something that has to be maintained and uh, fed, right? Do you have any problem to uh, um, uh, let people understand that, or it, it's easy for you uh, oh, to no, trigger it's their, easy. Their, their persistence? Yeah, so, yeah, and I think it, all it takes is for someone to not do it for a little while and they realize they have to do it again. Because, they, you know, because like, especially with things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, once you stop the therapy, and the same with COPD. Like I can help my husband, but I can't fix it. I can't, I can't make it, I can't reverse the damage that's done. I can just make it so that it doesn't get worse and that, the, that all the symptoms are under control. Um, and that's very much the same with Alzheimer's and dementia or in Parkinson's. Um, now with, with, with Parkinson's really, Clients, if they're if they're pretty far advanced, and most of the ones I, I dealt with were, they really need to do it every day, and so that's why I create. I, I work with the company that has Dr. Bartel's um, cushion, and we the cushion is only three or four hundred dollars. People can take it home. I give them the frequency that they need to use, and then they, they use, can it. use it every day. Yeah. So they use it as a cushion, so they can uh, recreate the, the the vibration. And if they need more, they come to see you again in a consultation. But they can have that as a maintained uh, system. That's fantastic. I did not know that. Uh, you said that you were working with uh, in a sport clinic. What were you doing there in sport with sport? Well, it was it was a um, it was a Russian doctor actually. He's passed away since, but they created a, a light therapy, a, 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 a um, far infrared light therapy that they used for sports, mostly basketball players where we happen to be. Um, and so they, they were working with uh, the light. They also had massage therapists and, and an acupuncturist. But the big thing for them was the, the light therapy. And that's why we ended up working together because we wanted to see how the frequencies were working together. And when you did put them together, it really was quite astounding, especially for some of the kids who came in with like, you know, big ligament problems and so forth from sports injuries. So um, yeah, that was really an interesting time. And, and, and actually I, I include light therapy in the book because there is a, a, a fellow actually in, is he in Toronto, Montreal? Montreal, I believe, um, V-Light. And in Montreal, a, like, Toronto, a, yeah. We, we spoke Toronto, about that. Toronto. Yeah. Yes, Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we spoke so, about so them. So they use that as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, for dementia and for many other things. Yes, yes. But it's powerful therapy. Yes. We had uh, a journalist uh, from Australia that uh, in one of our speakers in the channel. So it's a fantastic uh, point because uh, she actually spoke about v -Line, this company, and they are using infrared, and it's fantastic. I am also using infrared, uh, laser, low laser light therapy, but it is, it's all about vibration, huh? isn't it? It boils down to, because if you think about it, everything, this mouse, my, the chair I'm sitting on, the computer, it's all vibrating. Like people it think is. that it's solid, but if you look at it, it's vibrating all the time. Right. And the cosmos is vibrating all the time. Yeah. So we have to recognize that light, the light that you've got here, that's not a solid stream of anything, that's a vibration, yeah? It is, it is. Uh, at the beginning of our interview, you said something that uh, flashed in my mind. You said that 
before you were doing that, you were having an unhappy life. Uh, would you say, uh, that's a, a little bit of packed question, but <laughs> would you say that you were, were, you were your first client, your first patient? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 100%, 100%, yeah. Because I can remember so vividly picking up that little harp it was a little 26 string harp from Dusty Strings in Seattle, and they're still making awesome harps. I picked up that little harp, and I picked it up the wrong way because I didn't know anything about harps. I literally didn't know. I thought it was like a guitar, and you had the sound box facing out. I didn't know. I just knew that I was supposed to pick up that instrument. And then when I figured out which way to do it, laying the harp, and, and for anybody, that many, many people use harp as therapy. I didn't know at that time. But when you lay that instrument against your body and you strum it, even if you don't know what you're doing, even if you're just doing glisses, which is just running up the strings, you are setting up a frequency. You're setting up a vibration in your body. And I think that might be why I was, well, it makes sense for me then to be in vibroacoustic therapy and, and, and so forth, because that, that feeling, that vibration is so important. And it did. It healed me. I, I, my whole life changed. I mean, everything changed when I. Mm. I have a memory to share with you, Kate, if you allow me, because it just came oh, back please. to my mind. When I was very young, maybe 21 years old, I had a job during the census in Canada. I was going from home to home. At that period of time, they were not uh, uh, by computer and through the internet. Yeah, you had to uh, to fill the forms, and um, I was assigned to a certain area where the very rich people was were there. It's, it was in Sherbrooke City, and I ended ah. up in in a house in the middle of a, such a huge land. And I knocked at the door and a wonderful, maybe 75, 76 years old lady appeared to me. And I, I saw that uh, she was the wife of the judge, right? And uh, she was very elegant and she welcomed us. I was with another person. And I started, uh, you know, the questions and I turned my head and uh, I said, uh, that's a fantastic instrument that you have there. It's a harp. And she says, yes, I was a harpist. I said, oh, really? She says, yes, but I didn't play since 20 years. It's just a decoration there. Oh, yes, exactly. This is what I did internally because I was a dancer at that time. I said, would you mind play something for me? She looked at me and took well, 30 seconds to, to think. And she said, why not? And she took a random chair, sat and played one minute. And she stopped and she was transformed and looked at me, stood up, came to, came to me and look at me like her eyes wept and said, thank you so much for being there today. So I can't, I can't forget that because she, she didn't play for so long, you know? And what you just said, having the harp on her, she was like bonding with the instrument that was just fantastic. And I was seeing her uh, living room it was a, a clean, like extremely clean, you know, and aseptic. And I, I, I believe that lady, after I left, revived that this, I, I was having that dream, I hoped, because yeah. when I entered that house, she was very elegant and extremely polite, but dead inside. Okay. Empty. And empty, right? And she played and she, she played something like if it was yesterday. It was so beautiful. That's the first time I heard harp of my life. I was like, 
19, 20 years old. So it was so beautiful because it's a classical instrument. Yeah. There yeah. is, uh, there, is, there are composers. Story. You like that story? <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. And you know what? It's so true about, about um, people who stop playing. I was a classically trained pianist. Um, I got my, my, all of my training done by the time I was 14 because I, was, I started at the age of four. Um, I got married the first time at 18. Mm. And from the time I was 18 until I picked up that harp when I was 32, I didn't play. Oh, really? Um, and I think that uh, I think that that was one of the reasons I needed to play was for that hole in my heart. And so when you said about that lady not playing for 20 years, I completely understand. It's it's tragic. You can and relate people, to it. Yes, absolutely. And, and I, I, I used to teach harp all the time when I was in Canada and in the U.S. Um, and people would come to me and say, you know, I always, always dreamt of this. I don't play. I'm afraid of being, but I feel like I need to. And I would say, it doesn't matter how well you play. You don't ever have to play for anyone else. All that matters is that you play for you. This isn't about performing. This is for your heart. Right. And, and I think that what you just said is such a perfect example of that. It doesn't matter how. And same with singing. You know, yeah. people say, oh, I don't have a good voice. And it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't. Just sing. Just yeah. express your heart. Which, which, which we can see with elderly people, right? When uh, we make them sing. Like my father was singing La Bolduc. And uh, suddenly he woke up and memories came back. So I strongly believe that there is something in the brain that happens with music. Well, there is, definitely. Do you define yourself yeah, as a music therapist or only a uh, vibro? How do you, what is your <laughs> definition of your profession uh, right now? Oh, yeah. Take. Uh, so a, a music therapist, I am not a music therapist. A music therapist is a very special designation. It's a legal designation. Okay. And it's people trained in psychotherapy with music. So I am not, I do not have that training and I'm very clear, very sure to make people understand that I am not a music therapist. I'm a sound therapist. Oh. So what a sound comes from, whether it's from vibroacoustics or whether it's from the harp or whether it's from working with drums which I, I also uh, highly recommend for people. If people don't feel like that they can play a musical instrument, like they're, it sounds too complicated, get a drum, get a, get a, a, a baudron or get a, a, a pan drum. It doesn't matter because that, that drumming, that motion, that beat is very, very powerful. Pulsation from the heart. I know that from the people here in Sri Lanka huh? on the beach, the, the, the beach dwellers. The beach, uh, <clears throat> the people that lives on the beach and that are slum, living in slum, what they do right night time, they don't have electricity. What do they do? They play drum and they sing. Okay. And, it's, and they dance. Of, of course, but they, they mainly sing with their, their heart. And it's just, it is just fantastic. Wow. Uh, Kate. I didn't hear enough about your future book. I want to hear a little bit more about that. What are you going to talk about? Sure. So the book is coming out hopefully September 12th, if all the stars align properly, which would have been my mom's 82nd birthday. Uh, it's called, yeah, because it's all, it all came about because of her diagnosis, right? They got me on my research quest. Um, it is called Don't Let the Memories Fade. A holistic approach, and this is very important, a holistic approach to preventing dementia and creating a healthy, vibrant life. So everything that you need to know about it is right there because it's all about a, a whole foods, plant-based diet. So what I did, this I was my first patient again here because I was starting to have memory issues and I think it was partly because of stress, but I was having memory issues my personality was changing, and I, I, I could almost see what happened to my mom happening to me. So I was terrified. I sure didn't want to go down that road. So I started researching to make sure I didn't, and then it started. I started sharing it with people, and and 
all kinds of other people started getting, you know, on this idea, this program. So a whole foods plant-based diet, lots of exercise. You need to get at least half an hour a day of aerobic exercise, play music, learn a language, watch your stress levels, deal with it in a good way. Meditation is hugely important. Meditation yeah. or prayer, whatever it is you need to do that, that spiritual part of you. Right. Um, and uh, playing music, of course, um, listening, listening to silence, listening to music, being mindful. I have in the program, in the book, every day I take the seven, every week in the eight-week program, uh, we, we start with the seven attributes of mindfulness. So we go through one attribute a week and, and have a chance to meditate on those and to think about those. What does that mean for me as I'm changing my lifestyle? Because it is a lifestyle change for most people. Most mm. people are not going to do all this probiotics and all of those things. But it's a very comprehensive program. So I explain to my readers what the risk factors are, what to watch out for in your own life, um, and how to make sure that you don't go down this road. Because I truly believe, Francois, that nobody has to do this. No. This is not written in the stars. This is, we are, we make choices for our lifestyle, and every choice we make impact. has an impact. Big impact. Wow, okay, that's fantastic. I believe you will have an impact to my audience because you are just astounding. Uh, this is all the time that we have. <laughs> I can go on and on and on and on. And so all I have to say is, is thank you so very much. We will share the links of your website and all the links that you provided to us. And uh, we will share the wisdom. But mainly, thank you so much for you i've learned a lot today i there is uh, so many things that i did not know so i guess that it will benefit to many people i hope so i hope that's all i care about is that people benefit even if it's one person that gets something that helps change their life i'm happy and i'm grateful for the opportunity it's already done me <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Kate, and I hope to see you Thank one you. day. Have a good bye. Okay. I will share the link with you. Huh? Okay. Thank you, my dear. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye.